Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. And I want to thank uh, Strand Bookstore for uh, inviting us here and setting this up. We just got through signing 500 books, and it was smooth as silk. They really, it was like a well-oiled machine. We were very <laughs> happy. So, you know, I've got to say, you know, Strand is a fantastic bookstore. It's been my dream to give a talk here, especially about my own book, and specifically in the erotica section, and for whatever reason, <laughs> that's, that was part of the, of the, yeah, don't pretend like you didn't notice. <laughs> we requested that. I saw people looking over there. Oh, it's possible maybe some of you didn't notice because we're terrible at noticing things, right? We, we don't realize or notice most of the things that are happening around us. That's because that's the way our brains work, right? Our brains filter out most of the information that's around us. And then it constructs out of that tiny little slice of information that it chooses to pay attention to a, a story that we tell ourselves. And that's how we have this running stream of consciousness. It's really a complete fiction that our brain is telling us. It's based on reality, enough that we don't die, right? That's evolutionary pressure. Uh, but there's tons of flaws and biases in there. And that's essentially what the book is about. It's like, that's one of the pillars in the book. Neuropsychological humility, basically knowing your brain, knowing how it works, knowing its limitations, knowing its flaws, because that's kind of an important thing. The brain is the ultimate tool that you use to investigate the universe, right? The whole world. Everything ultimately has to get filtered through your brain. That's the ultimate scientific instrument. And so not, you, if you don't understand how that instrument works, you don't know how to calibrate it, how to correct for its errors or its flaws or its weaknesses, that's going to affect everything, right? Everything that you think and that you believe, everything that you think that you know. So then how do we know what's really real, right, as the book says. How do we know what's really real? There's, it's an amazingly wonderful universe out there. It's you know, endlessly fascinating as far as I'm concerned. But at the same time, it's horrifically complex, right? And not only is it horrifically complex, but there's, you know, there's other forces out there who are actively trying to deceive you. So it's not even as if it's all just about figuring out how the universe works. You also have to sort through you know, all everyone else's narratives, right? Because everyone else's brains are constructing stories about how the world works, and that's based upon a lot of misinformation, on culture, on whatever their parents taught them was real, on authority figures, on, you know, all sorts of marketing narratives, ideological narratives, tribalism. All of those things are going into creating these narratives that people have, and we pass them on to each other, and we're all basically lying to each other all the time. Not intentionally, but we are, all of us probably on a daily basis are passing along some kind of misinformation. That's just, the, that's just the way it is. Most of the facts that you have probably heard in your life are wrong, right? I mean, probably only a tiny fraction of them are actually correct. Probably most of the books in this store, I know this is not a popular thing to say on my book tour, <laughs> but I say it every time, most of the books in the store are probably full of it, right? But, uh, the entire self-help industry, it's almost entirely misinformation from beginning to end. Uh, well, a friend of ours, Richard Wiseman, published a book, a self-help book, about why every other self-help book is wrong. <laughs> it's called 59 Seconds. Like, this is what the research shows. No one's actually telling you this in the entire self-help industry. Because it's not based upon selling you facts. It's based upon selling you a narrative, right? A story that will sell, that is marketable, a brand, right? There are, most things are branded in some way. We live in a capitalistic society, but even in a non-capitalistic society, parties are branded, ideologies are branded. These are, what, what is a brand? It's something that's designed to push your buttons, even ones that you don't know are there. Those are the most dangerous ones, right? That you, know, you can be manipulated in ways that you're not aware of. I guarantee you that's the case. Unless you are a psychologist and or marketing executive, there are tons of ways that to manipulate you that you have no idea about. There's an entire literature research paradigm around how do we get people to buy shit they don't want, <laughs> right? I mean, Steve, I mean, does that mean it's not my fault that I ate a whole quart of Ben and Jerry's? That's right. <laughs> so we do make decisions, brother. We can't <laughs> completely <laughs> offload responsibility for those decisions. But yeah, the, with Ben and Jerry's is actually a good, a good example. That, so that's something that we have made that touches our buttons. We didn't evolve with ice cream and cheesecake, right? But that exists in our world because it appeals to us, you know, not neurologically, biologically. We have this access to these, um, these super stimulators, right? Like erotica actually fits that. This has been written about from an uh, actually academic point of view. It's like, yeah, we, we actually are surrounded by stimuli 
that are optimized for our evolved senses, but they have, they're so overstimulating us beyond what we ever were exposed to in our evolutionary milieu, like ice cream, right? But that's why obesity is a problem. It's not, you know, people think that they're in control of what they're doing, but actually there's lots of other forces out there that control our behavior. Most of the time, we're not really thinking at a t hierarchically top level in our brains about what we're doing. Most of the time we're on autopilot. Because autopilot works most of the time. That's, our brain also evolved to be maximally efficient, right? To use the least amount of energy possible. We have to because, again, we live in a horrifically complicated world. We have to make quick decisions. And if you got bogged down in the minutia of every tiny little decision, you couldn't get through your day. So the brain evolved these quick little, you know, what we call heuristics, little rules of thumb, ways of making quick decisions that are mostly true most of the time and are optimized for survival. Unfortunately, they're not optimized for surviving and thriving in a technological civilization, right? There hasn't been enough time for us really to adapt to that. And so now here we are living in this incredibly wonderful but complicated world. And a lot of people have figured out a lot of ways to manipulate other people. Marketing, politics, religion. It's, you know, all these are things that really speak right to our, our biases, our emotionality, our tribalism. You know, it's amazing how much you can predict about people just by knowing one piece of information, right? Like if I know your party affiliation, I pretty much know if you thought that <coughs> Professor Blasey Ford was more credible or Justice Kavanaugh was more credible. It's an incredibly easy thing to predict about somebody. Being predictable, I, I, I hate being predictable because it tells me, oh, that means I, if I'm that predictable and I'm, I'm you know, frustratingly predictable in some ways, like my politics are pretty much entirely determined by where I grew up and the family that I grew up in. I like to think they're my own beliefs and my own ideas and my own sensibilities, but I have to admit, I'm absolutely boringly typical for somebody who comes from where I come from. And that's the way most people are. Most, most people have the ideology that they were born into. Um, so how do we get out of all of this, right? How do we get out of ourselves? How do we transcend our culture and the lies that everyone is telling to us and our monkey brain that we're struggling to understand the universe with? And that's the other pillars of the book. Like the first we sort of tell you, okay, yeah, this is all the ways in which your brain sucks, you know, and that's just the way it is. Uh, but here are some tools that you can use to overcome that. And there, these are tools that human beings have, because we're also really clever. We are clever damn monkeys. We really are. And there are the, but the smartest and best of us have been thinking about this for thousands of years. And they've, they've gone really far. They figured out entire sets of methods of how to basically correct for our biases and our flaws. It's called philosophy and logic and science, right? These are, a, it's not a set of beliefs, it's a set of methods, of intellectual methods. Simple things, you know, starting with some simple things like, we should probably count all the data and not just the ones that I want, right? It sounds obvious, everyone smiles and it sounds obvious, because it is obvious when you put it that way. But I can't tell you how many times people don't do that. We, we, we inherently don't do that. Inherently, we engage in what's called confirmation bias, which means we notice, accept, and remember, and interpret bits of information that support what we want to believe and what we already believe, what is comforting to us, what meets our emotional needs. And we don't even realize we're doing it. We're just filtering all the information out there and weaving it into an, our narrative that meets our emotional needs. And that's, that's the default, right? That's what you're gonna do unless you're like, wait a minute, how do I know this is really real? Am I being biased? What happens if you take a more rigorous approach to this question and look at all the data in a rigorous way? Right, other simple rules are like, you should actually measure stuff, you know, rather than just estimating how much or guessing, because that's, every time there's, every bit of wiggle room you give yourself, is where a bias is gonna alter your perception to meet your emotional needs. So science is all about removing all the wiggle room, right? You measure things objectively. You count all the data. You make the rules before you look at the data. You can't change the rules as you go, because guess what? If you do that, you're gonna change the rules to have the outcome that you want, not the outcome that reflects reality. This is also why, like we say, our oh, anecdotes are misleading, right? Anecdotal evidence is just is uncontrolled evidence. It's just ob casual observations. 
Okay, that's a good starting point. You know, you're observing the world, fine. But anecdotes are not a way to answer questions because they're, they're just overwhelmed with your bias. They're overwhelmed with confirmation bias. They will lead you to conclusions that you want to be true, not conclusions that actually are true. So we have thousands of years of philosophy, logic, and science to help us overcome our millions of years of evolution in our monkey brains, right? And it's all there for you. We don't have to reinvent this wheel, right? We can stand on the shoulders of giants and you know, avail ourselves of the collective wisdom of billions of people over thousands of years. That's a lot of crowdsourcing. And they've been arguing about these things amongst themselves. And the best ideas have tended to survive. Um, some not good ideas have also tended to survive. Uh, not by, because of cultural inertia, not because of any inherent value. Uh, but you, know, we, you can sort through them. You, you can use some, your own method of saying, okay, who should I trust, right? There's authority figures out there telling me all kinds of stuff that are mutually exclusive. They can't all be right. They can all be wrong, but they can't all be right. But who am I gonna believe? You know, I have to have some way of saying, all right, these guys over here are credible. I think I'm going to at least listen to what they have to say and have a good reason for rejecting what they say if I decide to do that, whereas uh, these people over here seem to be overwhelmed with bias and tribalism and um, I don't find them to be a credible source. And th even just doing that, thinking about your own thinking, what we call metacognition, that's thinking about thinking puts you on a totally different path than never thinking about how you think, right? If, just, if you don't think about your own thinking, then you're just a slave to evolution, right? You're a slave to your culture, to whatever your parents told you or whatever the society tells you, whatever your emotions are telling you. You're like a rudderless boat on a, you know, an ocean with lots of strong currents and you're just gonna go wherever the currents take you. Logic and science gives you a sail and a rudder and, and the ability to say, I wanna go over there. You know, assuming that over there is answers that are more likely to be reliable than other answers, right? We never have the ultimate definitive answer to anything, but you know, we like to be less wrong. That's kind of our goal. It's like I want my answers to be at least better than random answers. And you could totally get there. And it's in a way, it's fun. This has kind of been our life's work, is figuring out what things are real and what things aren't real, and how do we know and what methods work you know, and what methods don't work. And when people get profoundly wrong, what's going wrong? A lot of it is like, it's a bit of detective work, but it's also uh, like a pathologist, right? We're sort of pathologists of belief. And that's when I get really interested. Like we, we know somebody who believes the world is flat, really, really believies the world is flat. Not, not, they're not just pretending to, I mean, that's like part of their worldview now is that the world is flat. Unbelievable, like I can't, imagine how somebody gets there with their, how they twist their logic, but they do, and they arrive at that conclusion. To me, that's like an advanced disease. Like I wanna know, how, what's, what's the pathology? How's it going wrong? What, what errors are they making? It's gotta be something profound, right, to get to that conclusion. Because basically, if the world is flat, that breaks all of science. Like you have to disbelieve everything. And it turns out that's actually, that's a, that's a, a feature, not a bug. Right? They, they want, that's what they're looking for. If, if they can prove the world is flat, that means they can dismiss every authority figure ever and they, can, they don't have to believe anything they don't want to because no one has ever told them the truth. If you could pull off that a kind of lie, then all of science goes out the door. That's actually what they're looking for. And that's interesting to me, that you know, what's their motivation? What is their twist of logic that they get there? And then I love confronting somebody with pretty much definitive proof that they're wrong and then see what they do. That's, a, that's, you know, that is like the ultimate test of not just character but also what's their intellectual method? Are they a skeptic? Are they you know, a scientist? Are they reasonable? Or are they a true believer? Where along that spectrum are they? And most, nobody really is ever gonna go, oh, I see you're, you're correct, right? Is anyone ever talking to anyone else ever, right? <laughs> People don't generally say, oh yeah, I was wrong, and now I see you got a good argument there, that was right. I mean, occasionally we do that over little things. Anything big, anything emotional, hmm, it's not gonna happen. But you can plant a seed, you could say, listen, just think about it this way, you know? And the, the more you can understand how the pathology of their pseudoscience that they're using or their logical fallacies or whatever, the better you can sort of get a handle on that. But the important thing, of course, is to look inward, right? Because this is, you know, logical fallacies and er biases and errors in thinking are not just something that other people do. 
It's something that we do, right? So this, these tools that we're giving you is not a way to argue against other people. It's a way to make your own thinking better, right? So that your conclusions are, first of all, we want you to say, all right, I don't really care about the conclusions themselves, right? You first of all have to remove any identity or emotional stake that you have in any particular fact or conclusion, because that's just an obstacle to thinking. You can't really care about what's true. You have to care about the process of deciding what is true. And once you decide about the process more than the conclusion, it's really freeing. And we have a lot of people who email us, and like once they get it, once they sort of realize, they've been listening to our show for a couple of years, and like I'm really sort of wrapping my head around the idea of letting go of, of some belief system, and like it's so freeing. It's like I don't have to support this nonsensical belief system anymore. I could, it's okay not to believe in it. And, and they really love that. It is empowering. It's really tra you know, transcendental kind of experience. And like I could actually just think about it and believe only what I want to and what makes sense. And you get better and better tools for deciding what makes sense. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible journey, you know, and it really does get rid of a lot of baggage. Um, and again, that's basically what the book is about. Here's how our brain is flawed, here is science, here's philosophy, and now here's how we put it all together. We walk you through our own kind of journey towards skeptical thinking about a topic in particular, about or life in general, how to read the, you know, the media, how to, you know, t decide if an article in the press is likely to be true or not be true, how to talk to other people about their beliefs and your beliefs, et cetera. You know, basically how to live a skeptical life. And that's, you know, that's our goal, that's our mission with our podcast and now with the book. We'd like to leave the world just a little bit more rational than, than the way we found it. And, you know, I hope that we're doing a good job. Um, and there's nothing better, this is what we like to do more than anything else, which is stand up in front of other people, answer questions, and tell them a little bit about our worldview. So thank you all for coming here. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoy the book. And we're going to be here for a while to answer your questions. And then we'll do the book signing afterwards. So thank you. Do we have a microphone for the audience? No, so we do not have an extra Evan, you want to walk the microphone around? OK. So just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, hi, my name is Eric. I live in the city. I had a question I've been meaning to ask you for a bit. Um, don't know if this is still true, but I remember you mentioning on the podcast that there wasn't yet a um, Spanish translation of the book. And it reminded me about something I think about often. Like, my family's Colombian, and I've always been struck by, like, if you think local American news is bad, like, Latin American news is really terrible in that, like, you'll off, like, I remember watching Primer Impacto on Univision, and they would very credulously talk about, like, a haunting or like someone possessed by a spirit and the priest had to come exercise them. And it's always really struck me how just credulous for whatever reason in the culture that's been. Mm -hmm. Like until recently there was a resident astrologist on like Primer Impacto on Univision. And so I guess um, just a general question asking for advice or if there's any resources for trying to reach out to like this like Spanish-speaking community and especially people in Latin America, because I feel like that's a thing that's sort of lacking currently. Yeah, do, do you want to say something? Else? No. So um, there's a couple things about that. It's a great question. The question is, what about pseudoscience in other cultures in other parts of the world, and how do how do we address that? Are there any resources for that? So most countries do have skeptical organizations, and so you, you can find one pretty much anywhere. There's definitely ones in the Spanish-speaking world. In pretty much every country in Europe, you know, they're all over the place. There's Hong Kong skeptics, Korean skeptics. They're there. So just look for them. There's this thing called the internet. You know, where you could go on there. <laughs> okay, you got you heard about that. Okay, so um, so there are resources out there. And they, but this is why we want our book to get as tra translated into as many languages as possible because people you get emails all the time. When's there going to be a French version? When's there going to be a Spanish version? Like uh, we don't control that, but you know. You could ask our publisher. Uh, we're, we're working on it. Um, but the other thing that's really fascinating to me about that is when you, because we, you know, we're Americans and we have a reputation around the rest of the world of having, we, like, we only look at America and everything else is like, we don't really pay that much attention to the rest of the world. But when you do look at the rest of the world, you learn a couple of things. First of all, they have different pseudosciences. You know, they have, some are the same, 
but they have a lot of different ones, and they and they sound really dumb to us because they're different, right? Right? The 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 crazy beliefs of other cultures sound weird, right? And you have to realize our beliefs are just as weird, you know, and it kind of puts it into perspective, you know. You think because yeah, the things that you grew up with, even though they're magical beliefs, it's like yeah, but this is what everyone believes, you know. Like if you grew up in China, you believe in chi. That's just the way it is, right? And if you grew up in New England, you believe in ghosts, probably, right? If you grew up in California, you believe in everything else, right? Homeopathy. <laughs> I didn't grow up in California, by the yeah, way. I just live, live there now. You live there now. <laughs> so um, yeah, so. Uh, but if you, but you think about these other cultures, you realize, oh yeah, if you realize that your beliefs are as silly to them as their beliefs are to you, then it kind of helps give you the perspective that they're all silly. You know, everything is silly. Everything is cultural, it, right? So I, that's, I think, always gives fascinating perspective. It also shows you how bad things can get. When we argue about, you know, how bad could it get, right? Isn't science going to just eventually win out no matter what we do? It's like, well... Mm, yes and no, you know, but pseudoscientists can get so deeply embedded in the culture that they're not going anywhere, and they could be a huge drain on society. Steve, right. maybe it would be a good idea to have, to cut your skeptical teeth, so to speak, on, on pseudoscientists from another... Just hold it lot. Just hold it really from another, In another country, because you have no emotional investment in, in those weird beliefs, right. so you can develop your skills, you know, de debunking... Uh, Bigfoot or whatever, and then when you you could turn your skeptical eye towards the stuff going on in your country when you're more prepared to but deal I, with it. But I actually like take issue with that, right? Because I think from a psychological perspective, it's really important to understand the cultural beliefs in order to penetrate them. And so to understand why, for example, a haunting or you know with the deeply entrenched religiosity that might lend itself to some of these issues, it's important to understand it in an effort to communicate about it, right? A big a theme in the book is like, how do I deal with my uncle at Thanksgiving who believes, you know, X, Y, Z? And it's like, you have to find common ground. And it's really hard to do that if you can't empathize at all with where that person is coming from. So, you know, for me, I think that when you look at different cultures, and especially like, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, and I, I see this also in um, a lot of my extended family, is that there are still things, it may seem crazy, like somebody talks about ghosts or hauntings or whatever, but sometimes they don't even actually believe it. It's just so entrenched that's how they talk. The same way that people around, it, like in American culture might say like, oh, my grandma's watching over me. And then when you like question them, like really, you think your grandma's like up there like looking at you? And then they're like, well, no, but I mean, it's just a thing you say. You know, it's funny how entrenched these things become. And if you just question them a little bit, but you maintain common ground, um, you can actually get people thinking about them. Yeah, I think you guys are talking about two different things. You're talking about like talking to people and convincing sure. them. Bob's just talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, just yourself understanding, is this true? Why isn't it true? Gotcha. Your own skeptical yeah, process. Yeah, oh, right. okay. Yeah, and yeah. people who have written into us have said that that's how they came to question their own mm -hmm. beliefs. Is first, they sort of learned the skeptical toolbox on the low-hanging fruit, stuff they don't care about that other people think. And then eventually, like, oh, I gotta turn this inward and question my beliefs. Yeah. But and they had to, that's not the first thing you do. You don't start out going right to the heart with a stake, right? Because right? yeah. no one's gonna go for that. And people will often say, well, you know, why are you skeptics even talking about Bigfoot? That's so 30 years ago, it's so ridiculous. Everyone knows it's fake. But it's, it's not true. It, like Bigfoot is a microcosm of, of skepticism itself. If you can, any, everything you learn dealing with Bigfoot can help you then look el elsewhere. And the same tools can apply to so many different pseudosciences. And also a shitload of people still believe in Bigfoot. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> well, that also goes to the point about the media, which I'm glad you, glad you brought up, just in Colombia and everywhere else. I mean, they all have these parts of their programming that appeals to the people who want that. I mean, they have to do it. It's, it's a business like anything else. Media is a product. It's a consumable. Even if you look at it that way, it makes a lot more sense that you have these sorts of things appearing in your news, which is why I like to remind people not to go to any one particular news source for any particular item, article, or subject matter. You need to really go to a lot of different ones in order to filter out the crap. The, uh, the subtitle of the book speaks directly to the fact that we live in a world with fake news. Um, and I think another way to answer your question is that there is a, there's a backbone to the book about learning how to detect things like this. You know, that, that's really what you get out of it. Like Steve is talking about this at a very deep neurological level. And, and I think, you know, on the 30,000 foot level, 
if you absorb this information, you're going to have a built-in baloney detector. Mm -hmm. Number one, that'll help you figure out what's bullshit. And then, you know, depending on who you are, if you want to tell your family and friends, well, we can help you do that, too. It's in the book. Um, and you, you will be smarter than everybody else, which is another added value. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, in terms of for an evangelical, it would be witnessing showing yourself as proof. My wife, who still believes in God, says she doesn't believe me when I say I'm an atheist because I say things like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, it's just such an entrenched part of our yeah. culture that I say it without thinking it. How do you get past that part so that people can understand, no, I really don't believe in God even if I say, oh, my God? Yeah, you know, we, we have this, like, internal debate, right? You know, atheists and skeptics and rationalists. Like, do we, should we discipline ourselves not to say, oh, my God? Although that might be hard in certain contexts. Or God bless you when someone sneezes. That's kind of ingrained <laughs> as well. <laughs> Right, God bless you. Yeah, I, I don't say that. I say gazunte. Right, that's what I say too. I say, I say, so bless, I say bless you, but I'm bless from Texas. You. I can't help yeah. it. But whatever. So from <laughs> so the one camp is it doesn't matter. It just it's just it's in the it's in the language. There's, most of the stuff we say doesn't mean what it originally meant, and who cares? It means what it means now, and it's kind of divorced. It's like Christmas, like Santa Claus. Santa Claus is so divorced from Christianity. You don't have to be Christian to like. But you know, be happy to see Santa Claus, right? Um, and in fact, it actually has pagan roots. You know, but that's a different story. But um, so yes, yeah, so that's the one side of the story. The other one is, is like, yeah, but we're sort of supporting this implied, you know, belief in culture if we buy into the language of that belief system. And maybe we should discipline ourselves not to. I don't know what the right answer is. I think that's kind of just something to think about and make a choice for yourself. And I've sort of decided like some things are probably worth not saying anymore, like. And sometimes part of it is because we want to be clear communicators. So, for example, like things you would never think of unless you've done 600 podcasts and you have people who will email you every time you step even slightly out of line, which we love, <laughs> which we love. But, no one here does that, I'm sure. No. But, like, for example, if we say, you know, oh, this a friend of ours passed away. We get shit for that. People's like, what do you mean passed away? Passed on to what? Are you saying you believe in the afterlife? It's like, No. It's, he, he's dead and he's rotting in a grave. That's what I think. But that's just a way, a, a euphemism that we use to sort of more politely say that they died. But we actually have started saying he, they died just so we don't get the email, right? <laughs> but it is, the, the bigger point is, we have that comment, you know, what's, what's the, what do we have to say here? Not to get emails. But um, we do want to be clear communicators. And so some people may take it the wrong way. And so, but I think you just have to make a case by case decision at the end of the day. I think in that, that's a really weird thing for someone to argue over because it's not very, a very good argument. Stakes are kind of low. But I mean, if you have to answer that specific question, then you just say, look, I grew up in the same house you did or whoever it is. I don't know if it's your wife or you know, someone yeah, like that. That'd be weird, or Just Jay. say, you know, this is where... That'd be really weird. Yeah. <laughs> my, yeah, my mother wife told me. No. But you have to rewind and slow down a little bit because their logic, that person's logic seems to be pretty low. And it just explains to them, I can't help it. I'm a product of the environment just like you are. You know, I say, oh, my God, and Jesus Christ. And, and some a lot people of other don't things. want to help it because, you know, just because I don't believe in God doesn't mean that I want to divorce myself from a, cult a rich cultural yeah. history. I don't want to pretend that people worldwide don't believe in God. Yeah, we don't erase right. history. Yeah, yeah what I mean, the hell are you supposed to say when you're having sex then? Exactly. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, I, I also, I have no idea. I don't know you or your wife, but I, strong, I strongly suspect that's not really the issue. Like when she says, oh, you still believe in God because you say that, I think she's ex probably expressing something else, like how it makes her feel to think that you don't believe in God or whatever. But that's something that you, I would explore. I, wouldn't, I don't think that logic is really where she's coming from. That's just my assumption. It's also really hard for some people who have this worldview that's very narrow to even imagine that yeah. somebody else could possibly live an atheistic life. And so she may just be searching for kernels, you know what I mean? Like things that are still in you that it, you're holding on to. It took about 20 years for my father to accept that I really didn't believe in God. He thought I was, that I wasn't being honest, you know? And he, do you remember what he said? Yeah. I think Bob. Yeah, when you when you get yeah. as you get older, you will see. Well, he said he said that. You also said, he said you're just saying that so you don't have to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> that was the first. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> that was the first thing that he said. But later on in his life, you when know, you get to my age, and he's been saying that. You know, now I am the age he was yeah. when he was first started saying that. 
But well, then he got to the you're point. You're a lot older, Steve. Where he was literally saying, like, when you die, I'll be waiting there at the gate. And I'll be like, see? <laughs> I can't argue with that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll see. Any other questions? Uh, I, I, um, I, uh, so my name is Henry. And you guys uh, are, as longtime science communicators, I'd love to just hear a few fun stories that you kind of experience talking to people. And you talk about that moment where you get to approach someone with rock hard evidence. I got something good. <laughs> so this was this is a friend of ours. Um, so we're talking about science. Like, you know, we, this is probably a year into the podcast, and we're starting to really get into it. You know, it's becoming like we're getting a, like crazy about it because we love doing it, and we we're really having a good time. And he's like, you know, yeah, okay. I mean, I like the show and everything, and I I agree with you guys. But you know, that voodoo though, <laughs> <laughs> and that was his one holdout. Yeah, he <laughs> believed. Everything that we said, he was skeptical about all pseudoscience, but that voodoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said it just like that. Yeah, yeah. And then we make fun of him to this day. Wait, 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 wait. who said that? said that? I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, we could. We don't, we don't, we don't Mikey, reveal our, yeah. you know. We, <laughs> he, Mikey knows him. Yeah. <laughs> no, Mikey, you can actually say it. We can. No. <laughs> <laughs> He'll come uh, looking no, for another you. Another fun story. So one of our first big investigations was the Warrens. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Oh, yeah. You guys are probably close enough in the region. They're like the New England's ghost hunters, and they made their career going around to colleges and talking about ghost hunting. And Amityville was one of their Amityville was based oh, yeah. on one of their investigations. <laughs> and so they have this big persona built up in movies and books and in, you know, in the... Annabelle, in the, you know, yeah. it's all part of their mythology. Yeah, and that movie that came out. Yeah. That's what he Annabelle, the Annabelle oh, series. Yeah. No, that's, no, no, the that's, one that just came out. Yeah, the haunting just came out. Or, the haunting or oh, the haunting, oh, yeah. And even more recent one. Which one? The Nun. The nun. I mean, whatever. They have a lot of... And they, they've them. been portrayed themselves. I've seen them portrayed in movies, like oh, these yeah. serious scholars. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And this is like right when we're getting started. So we had no experience. We didn't know what we were doing. And so we tell her, let's, they're like, they live like two towns over from us. So like, oh, we got we to investigate them. We were actually intimidated to investigate them. A big deal. A little bit. Yeah. No, we were. We flat out, because we were like, all right, we have to bring our A game. Like, we have to, like, we had no idea what we were doing. So we have to, like, really do a good job here. And then the bottom line is, you know, we, we, we went to their house. They, 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 you know, agreed to, like, to have, to talk with us so that we could, because we, you know, we said, yeah, we're just interested in your evidence. Like, we want to know. Like, do you have any good evidence for ghosts? So they were happy to bring us into the house and show us their crappy evidence. Uh, <laughs> I mean, their evidence. <laughs> which we later determined was crappy. Um, but uh, it turns out that they were just a sad old couple Aww. that really, I mean, they, were, they were happy, they were making a decent living doing what right. they were doing, but my God, did we overestimate them. I mean, they, it was really amazing. Like the dichotomy between their images on the television and just this cranky old couple was amazing. But the one thing that always we always, get into, always remember and stick out. So at one point, Lorraine, that's you know, the wife, said, what happened to you boys? Was it the science thing? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, yeah, that was pretty much it. You know? <laughs> she was talking about why don't we believe in God, right? But they, yeah, that was, that was the science thing. Yeah. <laughs> Remember their haunted, their haunted museum in their basement? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they um, had a, yeah, their their basement was the most haunted place in Connecticut, um, and it had a museum of haunted things, including a D and D like player's manual. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, the, one of those the original player's house. handbook. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Ed, can I borrow it, that? Yeah. <laughs> I like the story Randy tells about the Warrens. It had to do with the Amityville Horror. Um, oh yeah. It's you know the Amityville <laughs> house, in which uh, so they're all there. They pull up right, and they took taxis over there or whatever. And Lorraine steps out of the taxi cab at you know when it stopped, and she like goes to the ground. And she's like, oh my gosh, I can feel it. Oh my, and then she's having like these convulsions or whatever. And they're like, yeah, the house is like three houses down <laughs> over over there. It's like whoops, kind of uh, pulled pulled the trigger a little a little early there, Lorraine. <laughs> Any other questions? So I've been listening to the show for a while now. I've been listening to the show for a while now. And uh, it's gotten to the point where last time I was in a uh, grocery store buying salsa, I wouldn't buy a bag of chips because they all had the GMO butterflies yeah. on. Good for you. <laughs> so I had to go home and eat my salsa with carrots, which really was not good. <laughs> so where do you guys say, well, I'm going to just buy that bag with the butterfly on it, and I'm going to have my salsa with <laughs> chips rather than with carrots. Yeah. 
Yeah, you got, I don't buy non-GMO products. The products that are labeled non-GMO free or GMO, non-GMO project, because that's pseudoscience and they're misinforming the public. And it's not even a governmental body. It's just a private organization who's charging a VIG to other companies to have this seal on it that they made up, which is based entirely on pseudoscience. Well, will you go without? I absolutely will not go to a restaurant or not buy the chips. But, you know, Steve lost 50 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> That's why. That's I true. I can't eat anything. And I hate that. You find something you really like, like, fuck, you know, Twinkies are GMO free now. I mean, you know, my holdout <laughs> is smart food. If, they, if smart food goes non GMO, I'm still going to eat it. I don't, yeah, I, I have a harder time. Like, I know it's important to vote with your dollar, but it's also important to, like, live your life. And I think that it's about kind of finding the places where you're willing to make the concessions. You know, I drive an electric car, and it's, I'm really mindful about a lot of, you know, usages of plastic and things like that. And it, But, like, I live in L.A. Like, I can't find food if I don't eat food that's not labeled. You know, so I, I, you know, if there is a choice in front of me, I'll usually choose the, you know, I never choose the organic over the non-organic in the produce section because I don't want it to rot the next day. But I will, like, if if it's the only choice available, I'm not going to, like, not get vegetables. You know what I mean? So it's a struggle. My mother-in-law has to eat gluten-free. Mm. For real, mm. and uh, for real, I love that you have to <laughs> <laughs> parenthetical. And she'll bring her stuff over all the time. One day I'm e- there and I'm eating these cookies, and and then she's like, "Oh, you like those?" I'm like, "Yeah, they're they're awesome." And she's like, "Those are gluten free," and I got mad. <laughs> I'm like, "How can these taste good? They're, these these aren't gluten." I'm like, "I did first, then I'm like, these can't be gluten free." You know, I look at the back and I'm trying to you know figure it out, but I I really don't want gluten free stuff to taste good, but they're figuring it out now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, sometimes if we have to buy something like that at the store, I feel like I'm buying porn or booze. Put it in a bag and nobody <laughs> sees it as I walk out. Uh, I, have a re- I have a related story. I bought something at, at a gas station and it came to six sixty six. And I was a little excited because, you know, six, six, and she actually changed the amount because she That's noticed happened, it. Yeah. And she, so I've it wouldn't be six, six, I'm like, next wait, time. Wait, did she make it 667 or 665? I think. Did she rip you off for a penny? or did she, <laughs> she, she lowered it like a dime and oh, I got okay. pissed off. <laughs> wait, if she, when she changed it, you should have said, I want the 666. <laughs> <laughs> I should have. Next time. <laughs> you have one last question, maybe? Anybody out there? What, so that, I'm not sure what that is. How about RBSD-free milk? What oh, is that? What that's, is a, that? that's the milk that doesn't have a, a growth hormone in it, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, so milk, um, first of all, like people, the, some of that is pseudoscience, right? The, um, so you say, oh, no antibiotics. Like, yeah, you, it's, you, there isn't any antibiotics anyway because they, you can't milk, a, you can't like milk a cow and put it in the market if they've had antibiotics. I think it's 30 days before. So there's already rules to sort of keep any hormones or antibiotics or stuff out of milk and dairy. So I think that's kind of more gimmicky. If they're really saying that like they weren't used in the growing of the mm-hmm. cows, and if, if for some reason you like that, that's fine. But it's not getting into like the food that you're eating, so you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I think that's more of like a, it, it's less of a health question. I think that's a lot of times what we talk about. When it comes to animals, it's very different than crops. And I think, you know, a lot of people might make decisions, ethical decisions and, and that are in line, you know, with their morals. And I think that that's fine. But if we're actually concerned that it's somehow unhealthy, I don't think that that's a real concern. Yeah, if they're claiming yeah. this is more healthy for you, that's not backed by science. Yeah. Don't drink raw milk. Don't yeah, drink raw, raw milk, milk is bad. Ooh, milk. I've had, uh, it's bad. I had it once. But <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any last questions? There was somebody else, yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, So my question is more about frustration. Mm -hmm. So when you are a very process-oriented meta-thinker, how do you deal with the frustration of people who aren't? And Kara mentioned something about finding that common ground, Mm -hmm. but if... So you start a podcast, (laughs) you write two blogs, and eventually a book. And that gets all your frustrations out. (laughs) That's that's a real formula. That that works. So, but we're real, we're real good at eye rolling. Yeah, yeah. Eye roll. real yeah. good. 
So I mean, so that's that. It can be very frustrating. Absolutely, you know. Uh, so we have each other for support network, and a lot of people again listen to our show and like, thank God you guys are out there because like they're, we're their support, their virtual or remote support network. It's good to have other people that you could you know commiserate with. But the other the other thing is the humility part, like the neuropsychological humility. It's like yeah, we all have this, right? They're not really any different than you, or, or the, you know maybe just by I say by the vagaries of chance you have come across people in your life who you know taught you how to think more clearly maybe or you weren't burdened with as much like you know pseudoscience or whatever you know we don't really um this is like a, the, getting into the free will thing, which I will make a hard free will argument at this point in time. But the point is, most of us are here because of just the vagaries of chance, not because of choices that we were in control of, right? I just said, most of you believe what you believe for reasons out of your control. That's just the way it is. And so that gives you a lot of sympathy for people, other people. And so you could make a choice to say, well, you know, I'm not going to ridicule them. I'm not going to think that I'm better than them because we're all we're all people again struggling to get through this life with our flawed monkey brains, and it's a dizzying world. I have sympathy for everyone, and most people who believe nonsense are victims. They believe that because somebody sold them a package of lies that was comforting to them or whatever had some that narrative was appealing to them in some way, and so I say, well, okay. So my role here is just to be a teacher, right? That's because yeah. that's what I like, just to be nurturing and say maybe I can help them get a different perspective. To me, that's like raw meat. That's like somebody, like, you know, like if some people like dirty things because they like cleaning, you know, like if you're like, a, I like cleaning up, so like seeing a dirty room is like, oh, I get to clean this whole room. <laughs> that's kind of me. Like somebody is like, you know, has a lot to learn. It's like, oh, wow, this is like fresh meat. I get this person has a lot to learn. That's great. But I think it's also important to remember that like some people don't, like you need to be invited into their world, right? So, uh, most of the people that we are surrounded with that are like true believers at this point, if if we are, if you consider yourself a skeptic, most of the people around you that are true believers are likely family members, um, colleagues at work. They're usually not like your closest friends because we generally surround ourselves with people who think the way that we do. We do, and you know, all of us have friends have that one thing, right? Yeah. Like the voodoo. The voodoo. Um, <laughs> but I do think that it's important to kind of understand the relationship, understand the strength of the relationship, and understand that there are ways that we can model behavior without forcing it. You know, I can say the things that I believe to be true, and I can set an example. And eventually, I do find that my friends, you know, I live in LA, so I have some friends who are really into a lot of woo, but they're very smart, and they have a lot of really critical capacity in other realms. And I find them saying things like, I know you don't believe this, but like, so they're, they're aware. Yeah. And I think they're, they're engaging more in the metacognition than they did before. So there are always going to be differences of opinion, but by modeling um, without forcing, they're not backing away and retreating, which I think is just as important as sharing the message. You know, you can't change the world, right? Mm. You know, you can maybe help a few people and, and do, do that and focus on the people that are willing to listen and, and you can have a conversation with. Like, I've learned to avoid people that are just blocked out. Like, you know, we've said it on the show many times. Like, our sister, you know, she's riddled with religion and, and conspiracy We actually haven't theory. said that on the show. I just said it. <laughs> We've said uh, it on private shows. We say, we say it in private, but we don't say All it. Right, well, now you know. <laughs> uh, but the, the point is, like, I refuse to talk to her about certain things. Yeah. So you got to do that. You got to, like Kara was like, saying, that, you know, edit, find your community. If you're looking for a community, I have one for you. I mean, you could, you could join our Discord. You know, we have hundreds of people on there that are talking all day. You know, the conversation is awesome. That's, your, that could be a, that's an instant community of people that you can get to know. We did uh, Nexus le this summer, this past summer, we did a poutine lunch, which you could join next year. That's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think you got to surround yourself. I, you, I see you guys all the time, right? I, I recognize your faces. No, I, I'm... You were this guy? You're not with her? No, I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, sorry, guy. I didn't mean to play. <laughs> yeah, I recognize him. I thought, okay, never mind. <laughs> See, my question was more, like, not one-on-one, -on -one, not with your circle of friends, yeah. The world. Oh, how do we not like pull out our hair every day? We feel the same way you do every day. Every day I look at like my feed reader and my news. It's depressing and it's hard. And I think for me, how do I manage it is I, 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 I focus on mental health first, right? Because I think that self-care is the most important. I need to be the most alert and aware and okay in order to do the work that I do. And if I 
fully feel engulfed by the you know the horrors of, of what's happening in the world around us all the time it's going to be crippling yeah. and so you know I say this a lot for like young women who work in science communication who deal with just vitriol online is that yes there is something to reading the comments because sometimes you get critical feedback that's important for your work but also you have to wake up that day and say I'm in a headspace where reading the comments is going to be helpful for me and if you're not don't do that to yourself it's not worth it so I think yeah I think you know self-care is is a, a critical part of being a good skeptic you, ha you have to take care of yourself because the stuff out there can like mess you up if you're not careful. Yeah, perspective helps too, because as bad as it seems right now, it's actually not that bad. It's true, because if you look at the arc of human history, most human beings lived under far worse conditions and still do today than we do right now. So this tiny little step that we're taking back is very frustrating, but it's nothing. Just think about what a medieval peasant went through. They, they knew nothing. They had no access to information. They believed whatever the, what the culture told them and they lived their life in an almost totally prescribed way. They really had no choices to make about their life except maybe who to marry unless their parents told them who to marry. Really, I mean, it was, they, they, we have access to like the magic box with the font of all human information, right? Have you ever had a question that you couldn't Google the answer to? I mean, now we're just used to it. We take it for granted that we, and, but it's amazing. You have, you could go, you could find any science article you want and at least read the abstract, you know, and, and or maybe even the whole thing. Uh, increasingly, you know, art, articles in science are being published open source, right? Where anybody can look at them. Um, so, the, you know, there's a lot of positive things to look at as well. And, I also think it's important to be an activist, right? If that frustrates you, right? It's like if something about the world frustrates you, fix it. Work to you, and you can't, again, we can't obviously, we're one person out of seven and a half billion, but just make your one little tiny corner of the world more the way you want it to be. And if we all do that, the world will be a better place, right? And go out and vote, you know? Yeah. <laughs>